I am Marisha Tweed. I'm one of the cardiology fellows here at Mayo Clinic. And My name is uh, Greg Shears. I'm a, um, a consultant at Mayo Clinic and the medical director of the ECMO team. We're here to talk about um, an article to be published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings Emergency Cardiac Support with Extracorporeal Membrane Oxygenation for Cardiac Arrest. And this was based upon a very interesting young female patient who came to us with a STEMI abruptly early in the morning hours. And I was part of the case um, and uh, lead author. It was a rather dramatic case. Uh, it it um, happened uh, in the wee hours of a Sunday morning when uh, 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 there are fewer staff around. Uh, we were called emergently to respond to a, uh, a failure to regain spontaneous circulation in this uh, young lady who was being revascularized in the cath lab. Um, it was a great example of how um, uh, the most multidisciplinary teamwork comes together to, to do the right things to help save someone. Mm -hmm. We had to provide um, CPR for a total of 53 minutes um, and uh, the cardiologist worked extremely hard to revascularize the patient but found that they weren't able to uh, that, that the patient's heart wasn't able to begin functioning adequately uh, within the, the, the time frame so we had to do something a balloon pump was inadequate. She was very unstable when she came to us had multiple bouts of ventricular tachycardia before we even started the case and shortly after we started gaining access arterially she went into a ventricular fibrillation arrest and required CPR throughout the whole case while we were shooting the coronaries. She was very unstable hemodynamically but also rhythm wise and despite us utilizing all the drugs we could think of and the intraaortic balloon pump we weren't able to fully resuscitate her and she continued to have uh, ventricular fibrillation and required uh, continuous uh, CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation as mentioned and uh, that is when um, the idea of ECMO came up and that is somewhat unusual in the cath lab for that to come up that early in the case in regards to an option but she was so young um, so very unstable I think we were to the point where we were concerned about options for her and we found that even an intraaortic balloon pump in itself wasn't offering enough support. Dr. Uh, Brian McLynch who was leading the resuscitation from the anesthesia side was very familiar with our ECMO practice. He was um, uh, really scrutinizing the quality of the CPR, changing out providers, doing compressions, doing all of the advanced ACLS type of resuscitation, frustrated that she wasn't turning around, but knew we had another option, had another tool. Uh, so he um, uh, called for the ECMO service to come in. We responded very quickly despite the, the early hours and were able to get her on rather quickly with the help of the cardiologist being right there with the prep groin, the ability to put in percutaneous cath catheters and give her uh, very good oxygen delivery. I think the most incredible thing that struck me is as soon as we established the ECMO support system for this patient, she stabilized very quickly, both hemodynamically but also rhythm-wise. And personally, as a trainee, I didn't expect that to occur so quickly and promptly. And it seemed like a stormy ocean had suddenly been calmed by the ECMO device and you know there was a great sigh of relief in the room because at that point we no longer needed to give her chest compressions and rhythm wise she was in sinus rhythm much more stable. It's amazing how once you establish a, a, adequate oxygen delivery how a patient and a, and a heart can turn around so quickly Things were looking incredibly desperate. Um, um, clinicians that have been in this sort of situation know. Uh, for example, um, as I was rushing into the room as we were bringing uh, the team together, um, her uh, anesthesia circuit was completely filled with pulmonary edema. I mean, there was no hope, uh, and it was constantly refilling. There was no hope of oxygenating her. It was just a, a very desperate situation. And um, so, Dr. Tweet said once she finally had some adequate oxygen delivery, away she went. And then we took advantage of some of the recent research regarding um, uh, providing hypothermia for 24 hours because she clearly had um, a potential neurologic ischemic insult. And that with the great care that the, um, the ICU uh, ECMO team provided, um, she had a really good outcome. 
And, you know, long term, of course, us providers are very interested in how these patients do. I do know the initial recovery for her was difficult, both physically, but I think also mentally. But she completely recovered her neurologic function and then slowly with the assistance of the outpatient cardiac rehabilitation program and her private providers has slowly been making recovery to get to the point where she can live a very uh, successful and satisfying uh, daily life. So uh, this is just very satisfying um, knowing how dismal things did look during our case and how a lot of us thought she wouldn't make it to know that um, all these steps together and the great teamwork that was performed on a multidisciplinary level um, has led her to not only survive the event but also potentially have a very good quality of life long term. It's amazing cases like this that um, allow us to sort of reset what is possible. Uh, we're constantly amazed at what uh, really high quality teamwork can do and uh, the application of this technology. So it was extraordinary. It's a, it's a life changing thing for all of us and especially for the patient. I also think an important thing is it, we have a lot of unstable patients who come to our catheterization laboratory as we get a lot of STEMIs and non-STEMIs and so forth. And I think an important thing for us to remember on the cardiology end is this option, particularly for a patient who is hemodynamically unstable or ha is having continuous dysrhythmias, to keep that as a back option for the appropriate patient candidate and to think of it early. I think that was key in this case is that it was thought of very early on and we were able to establish it while we still had a window of potential recovery. That's exactly right. A and trying to get out of the old-fashioned approach of just dialing up the inotropes and doing the same old thing and then watching organ um, dysfunction uh, occur. Um, so there's probably even intermediate cases that would benefit from such improved oxygen delivery. So, um, but the, the trick is, as Dr. Tweet says, you have to think about it early so that you can avoid that additional morbidity or mortality that's going to ensue by doing the same old things. I, I think a lot of people who cared for this patient were very happy with the outcome. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Very yes. satisfied. I already know that Dr. Sandu, who was involved with this case, has already applied early ECMO to another case of a patient who came in unstable, and I believe they also had a very good result. So again, it's a lesson, and as we become comfortable utilizing this early on, we'll learn how to pick the right patients and hopefully continue to help a lot of people. Yeah, I think it'll make a difference too. And the more people get comfortable with it, they see the benefits, they'll be, be willing to think about it sooner. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. so. We'll save more lives. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on healthcare at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.